very easily now. Okay, so chapter 29, Restriction of Production from Human Action, December 11th, 2019. First question is, what does restriction of production imply? So it implies some some sort of central planner as in someone is planning on how much of production there is so mm -hmm. i guess there and there's a whole bunch of other implications with that right uh, so it it wants to alter production uh someone wants to alter yeah the outcome that's what why they're restricting something and um, it's necessary consequences it's that it necessarily makes people poorer yeah <laughs> I always think of the you know the network model and it, it it forms like a hub and spoke model where everyone's waiting for the center to tell them what to do and like what they can uh, produce and that's really inefficient mm. because the the person who's planning it doesn't have um, it's impossible for the person in the center to have perfect knowledge even if like they had all the tools in the world there are just some things that like an entrepreneur producing cannot easily transmit to the to the central planner Like, uh, like information. Yeah. Like if you, you as an entrepreneur, maybe you're an entrepreneur and you're just really good going on gut feelings. Mm -hmm. Like you can't communicate that. Yeah. The power, there, right? Yeah. Maybe there's some rhyme or reason to your gut feelings, but you're not, that's not some information that you can communicate to a central planner and have the central planner, um, you know, take action on that. Oh, or yeah, they can't factor that in. To them. Right. Like maybe you could give the central planner all your numbers and everything and, and they, they can make this, maybe they can do, make really good decisions off of that, but they'll never get that perfect information from everyone. Hmm. What is the only thing that tariffs can achieve? What is the only thing that tariffs can achieve? Well, without um, cheating and looking in the book, my, my first guess would be, just be that it, it moves production from one place to another. Tariffs. Yeah. They don't actually... So they make people poorer because they can't get as much as they could have before. It um, weakens the balance of trade in mm. that pe people can't specialize as much in, in what they're best at. Yeah. Um, and trade f for, um, what's it called? Competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And then finally it, it just moves production elsewhere. Right. It's and it's interesting once you are in a tariff system, there are a couple different scenarios where either removing or adding tariffs like there's a certain situation where removing tariffs could be bad in the short run for um for, you know, the people of the country, but in the long run it works out. Example? So there's a so there's tariffs in New Hampshire on Bitcoin sales, and for in hypothetically hypothetically, <laughs> okay, um, so all the people you know selling Bitcoins in New Hampshire are I'm trying to think this completely through, so they're prof they're making way more profits. Um, because they don't have to pay the tariff because they're selling within the state. And then when the tariff's lifted, 
I guess the... Oh, well, they could buy... <clears throat> excuse me. People in New Hampshire could buy Bitcoins from anywhere. And right. then it would uh, be cheaper. Yeah. So that's it would not, hurt. Yeah, that's not exact. There is a few different scenarios, like thought experiments that they had in the book, where it was interesting. Like, I guess certain groups always benefit and other groups lose from the lifting and lowering of tariffs. Right. But, I mean, it's obvious no tariffs at all is the best system. Yeah, I think there are tariffs on automobiles Mm -hmm. that are imported from China. And so, let's say it's just an extra $10,000 that just gets added onto any car from China or Japan. And that helps Ford to produce cars that are about the same price or maybe even Mm. cheaper. And then... Ford can make a cheaper car and sell it for more money at home. Right. Whereas, the, the consumer's not getting the best car they can get. Right. The price of restrictions. What are the consequences of protectionism? I think we just talked about them. And um, the consumer hurts... Is the consumer's not getting the best product they can get. Right. And not only that, is it's uh, diverting production, you know, maybe because there's this inflated market for Ford cars, maybe some of the best engineers goes and works for Ford instead of use, putting their abilities to another industry. Oh, man. So, like, all across the board, it hurts. <sighs> yeah, it distorts the market all over the place. Yeah. What are the consequences of restricting the hours of work? I mean, I'm going to answer this in a little... I think the the modern day um, question of this is like, what are the consequences of requiring, you know, at 40 hours work, you have to give full benefits. And right. the big consequences we see here is that everyone has like five part-time jobs because... You're just not going to get hired for all of that. So it ends up hurting the worker because they have to work around and obfuscate these different restrictions rather than just working at the same place and building up. Man, that is so true. You make a great point about that where you restrict the number of hours of work thinking, hey, I'm this benevolent government. You should only have to work 20 hours a week. And they're like, yeah, but I need to work 35 hours a week in order to pay all my bills. So stop telling me I can't. <laughs> and because yeah. I'll have to work two or three different jobs. Just so right. I don't get the and, limit. And they can't, you can't climb up the ladder in two and three jobs. So it's right. like you're just, you're, you're stuck. It really hurts. So this restriction and interventionism, it is so insidious. Comment. Labor legislation, for the most part, merely provided a legal recognition of changes in conditions already consummated by the rapid evolution of business. Yeah. This was an interesting point from this book. That because of labor-saving devices and people's um, increase in productivity, businesses were able to reduce the number of hours of their staff before it was even legally um, or or politically Mm -hmm. uh, possible. But they can pat themselves on the back after they do that. (laughs) What is the only means suitable to eliminate the deplorable conditions for many Asian workers? Hmm. Um... I'd say capitalism. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think that's the answer. Um, because presumably, let's continue with the thought experiment that there is a $10,000 tax on all Honda products sold in the U.S. Well, that is really hurting the Asian workers because they, con- they, they have to continue to work for less money than they otherwise would be able to 
if they could compete on the open market. Right. So it's really continuing the so-called slave labor conditions that people um, detest. Right. Yeah, I would say that. And so what if... Okay, so what if, you know, there was a Chinese company that just outright, you know, had slave labor? Would it... Would it be just to have that, like, be extremely... A lot of tariffs on that, or you can completely ban the product? Hmm. My initial inclination is, is no, because uh, with what authority does someone have the right to tell me or you mm-hmm. that we're not free to interact with other free people? But then I think it's incumbent upon us to be aware that we're buying a stolen stereo, right, for example? Yeah. And to not buy things of questionable origin mm-hmm. because it just is wrong. Right. <laughs> so, um, but no, I don't think that anyone necessarily has any authority over us to tell us that we're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Cause what, where would they gain that? Right. Right. So that's kind of a struggle I have with, you know, the currencies like Bitcoin cash and Monero, because if you, cash shuffle your bitcoin like and i I guess there's a problem with cash too it's like you you don't know if it was stolen like you yeah you just don't know where it comes from yeah just a thought yeah I i would prefer to only um interact with morally upright and authentic um People and businesses mm-hmm. who've acquired their property through just means. Right. Provably just means. Restrictions as a privilege. Why does Mizi say the eagerness of the laws pet children to acquire privileges is insatiable? Insa- insatiable. Insatiable. Great word. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because, I mean, if you have friends that make the laws, you're going to benefit. Yeah. Without working. Restrictions as a privilege. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a good example. Any lobbyist ever? Yeah, lobbyists, um, the ability to control the money supply, for example, would be a, a unique privilege. Mm-hmm. I guess there are numerous, or um, too many to count. If each domestic industry is protected by its own tariff, will the move to free trade hurt them all? Oh, okay. This is what I was thinking of. Yes, it will in the short term. Because they're all protected by tariffs, so they all yeah benefit from well the, yeah. Tariffs. So they're all protected from tariffs, and then they're um, they're all removed. So that means foreign it, like no one can compete with foreign goods. So like their their imports would skyrocket. And there's going to be a big shuffle within the economy as people learn that exactly. what they need to specialize. Yeah, in so that's what I was thinking of early, and I thought it was kind of fascinating. It's like you can like get yourself in such a big hole; it's going to be really pain. Like you have to go deeper in order to dig yourself out. Uh, it reminds me of people who study useless things in college um, because of like mixed signals in the market where they. They wrongly perceive some value 
in an art history degree, for example, and then just like learn that, okay, this is, this is not a real uh, market. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of that. Finally, restriction as an economic system. Comment. Economics does not contend that restriction is a bad system of production. It asserts that it is not at all a system of production, but rather a system of quasi-consumption. Wow, brilliant. That is very well put. A system of quasi-consumption. Yeah, restriction. It's not about saying, oh, well, this is how we produce. You can only produce this many or this, that many. It's that you're, the producers are going to consume their capital if they know that there's a, hmm. a restriction. Right. Brilliant. Chapter 30. Interference with the structure of prices. The government and the autonomy of the market. What does interference with the structure of the market mean? Hmm, interference with the structure of the market. Ah. Enforcing floors, price floors, and mm -hmm. ceilings that deviate from the levels that would have ob obtained on an unhampered market. Right. And I think the most egregious example recently is the, the Fed starting to buy up treasury bonds again and increasing their balance sheet, putting a price floor Walk me through that? I don't understand. Yeah, so recently, so the Fed has basically started quantitative, quantitative easing again by buying up bonds and treasuries. Okay. And so when the Fed buys up bonds and treasuries, the Fed doesn't have any money. They, they, just, they have dollars, right? They can make dollars. They can invent dollars and buy things yes. with invented dollars? Right, so they invent dollars and they <laughs> create this floor. Right. So they say, um, we're going to buy treasury bonds at X price. Mm -hmm. And um, are there an infinite number available for sale or are there, is there a limited supply? Well, they, there's a limited, yeah, there's a limited supply. It's the, the money the government's trying to raise. Okay. Can, they yeah. can't just be uh, issued into existence, like... Bonds? Yeah. Well, I think that, yeah, that, um, I don't know. Well, um, basically, a bond is just a, a, it's a debt that will be paid right. in the future, so... So the Treasury says, like, we need a million dollars, and the right. Fed is like, we'll buy a million dollars worth of bonds at yeah. a rate of... Nine hundred thousand dollars, something like that, and yeah. that's the price floor that they put on it. Yeah. And then you'll pay us a million dollars later. Yeah, exactly. Sorry to get so basic, but I no, that it's a very complicated thing that yeah. I don't fully understand either. I would like to have more um, of a fluid under, like a total grasp the the best video is um i think it's mike maloney the hidden secrets of money he episode, does like an eight-part series right? yeah episode four has like uh it's like a 20 30 minute video and it's a complete flow chart of the creation of money i've seen that before but it's time for a refresher yeah it's, it's something i find i have to watch every like six to twelve months just to and i'm starting to understand it more and more yeah. But the main idea I get from it is that the Fed creates money by buying 
ass well it's not even just bonds and treasuries now they've like they've gone out and they've bond they've bought and they've bought um stocks and indices before creating price floors it, so they're these big economic manipulators that are like, yeah absolutely we need the price to be this so we're the we're the big guys with all the money so yeah we'll, we'll do it and make the price be this yeah they don't even have all the money they have no money They're, they have the power to make money hmm. well all right so what does uh interference with the structure of the market mean creating price floors and mm -hmm. price ceilings what are the forms of price control i think that yeah. just answered the question Comment, but the interventionist in advocating price control cannot help nullifying the very existence of economics. And a follow-up comment. The laws of the universe about which physics, biology, and praxeology provide knowledge are independent of the human will. Mm, right. Doesn't matter what we want. The laws of the universe will play out, and that includes praxeology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. That's not a common belief, I would say. That praxeology, I, I honestly didn't, I didn't even hear the word praxeology before I started reading this book. But I mean, of course, you grow up learning physics and biology as standard like phenomenon yeah but it seems like um praxeology or the study of human action is just as much a no not not as much but is along the same line of scientific endeavor that if this then that if you put hydrogen peroxide and oxygen or mix it in this combination then you'll have this reaction it's like and if you have um, people who demand a certain thing at this price and you have this thing available at that price, the action they'll take is this or that. It's like people are always looking to satisfy their next most um, desired mm -hmm. want. All right. <clears throat> to the market's reaction to government interference. What? are the consequences if the government establishes a minimum price higher than the market price. So, less people will buy the good, and, I mean, it depends, like, so you have, you have a large supply left over, mm. depending on, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what if, what are the consequences if the government establishes a maximum price lower than the market price? They'll sell out and, you know, not everyone who actually needs it will get it. Yeah, you'll have shortages. That's yeah. what happens in emergencies where the government says you can't charge more than some amount for water yeah. or gasoline. So people buy it all up. Yeah, and it's gone, and they and then, can't yeah. afford to like continue producing it. Yeah, and it's not worth it to import it. Where people could be like, well, I could go the next town over and go buy a thousand gallons of water. It'll cost me this much to go and transport it, so I have to charge a little bit extra to the people. But if you can't charge extra to the people, yeah. then there's no benefit. You won't bring the water. Right. Or, yeah, and exactly. You just or, it. or just cost more to bring it to the people. So it's Yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah. If rent control is imposed only on pre-existing apartment units, will it have any influence on the supply of new apartments? Hmm. 
print. Yeah, uh -huh. it would. I would say. The supply of new apartments. Only on pre-existing units. So. There really wouldn't. It it remove a lot of the demand for new apartments because. If. You know you have a rent controlled. Um, apartment in New York and you're paying a thousand dollars a month like no matter what you're never gonna move out so there's gonna and so n there's gonna be less people on the market looking for new apartments there are oh then there would be under a, a market condition right so like what if like in downtown Manha Manhattan all prices were froze frozen for you know something. existing yeah existing so you know if you're you're sitting in your apartment and you're paying what you perceive as like it's it's controlled so you're maybe it's worth 5000 and you're only paying 1000 a month you're you're not going to move out so all those people are not going to be in the market for new housing right so no one will be, so there'll be less producers of these new apartments. Hmm. For some reason, this is not clicking in my head. I just, I'm mm -hmm. not grokking this concept. It's, it's kind of, so I guess the, what is the definition of new apartments? Is it just like a, you know. A new building. Is it a new building or is it someone moves out and like if we moved out of this space this could be considered a new apartment no okay so new building yeah okay. that's how it works with as far yeah. as i understand okay so this i experienced this in san francisco and it was ridiculous the price controls for example the average one bedroom apartment in san francisco new is three thousand four hundred dollars per month mm-hmm for a one bedroom apartment in San Francisco. But I interviewed at places that were price controlled in very high value locations that where it was $650 a month. It's crazy. So there must have been, so you had an interview. So presumably there's like a, a lot of other candidates for the apartment. The person who lived there, like, can't move out. Mm -hmm. They have this sweet deal. Yeah. And they have to keep the chain going mm. so that there's, like, always a consistent group of people who's occupying this apartment so that the owner can never increase the price. Ah, uh, okay. And because the price is so low, the competition was fierce. Right. I mean, I interviewed with about 20 other people mm -hmm. and we were just the ones that were narrowed down from probably hundreds right okay so and i wasn't selected because of my taste in music oh wow it was it was like you can discriminate based on the smallest thing because the demand yeah. is insanely high right so think about it from the landlord's point of view and he's only making 600 a month for that high value thing so he is not getting more capital to produce new buildings yeah right and nor is he getting any kind of uh, economic indicator that there is uh, profits to be made furthermore what's hatch uh, what's actually happening in san francisco yeah. is that new houses are not being built for fear of being price controlled because any real estate developer in San Francisco who's experiencing price controls now on their apartment units says, well, why should I build another building? They're yeah. just going to get frozen at that new price. Okay, so I think that completely answers the question. Yep. So ultimately, it reduces the supply of new apartments. Yes. Okay. According to Mises, what are the two exceptions to the rule that price ceilings restrict the quantity supplied of a product?
I don't know. What yeah. are the exceptions to the rule? Let me cheat. This is, uh, this is in... Chapter 30. We're looking for exceptions to the rule for, for price ceilings. Yeah, it's section two. That's interesting because I can't think of any. I'm trying to think of like abundant goods, but I don't think that would be it. Well, I don't see an answer in the hmm. um, summary, so we'll have to take our best guess at this one. According to Mises, what are the two exceptions to the rule that price ceilings, which is a, a maximum price, or no, 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 a price ceiling. Yeah, you had it right. You can only charge $3 a gallon for gas. That's the ceiling. Okay. So you can charge... But a ceiling is... If you were to draw it on a supply and demand curve, the, the ceiling should be the higher one. And usually that's the, the, the minimum price that something has to be, right? Because it's, it's not... At, it doesn't include equilibrium. I don't know. I'm feeling very confused by this section. Um... The question is, what are the two exceptions that the rule that price ceilings restrict the quantity supplied of a product? So I'd say the, well, the higher the price ceiling is to relative to the market price, the less effect it does, has. So you could put a price ceiling on gas at $100 a gallon, and that is still a price ceiling, but it's not, it's so far away from the actual market price that it doesn't restrict anything hmm uh, I can think of one exception to the rule that price ceilings restrict the quantity supplied of a product if the price ceiling is above the market rate right is that what you were just saying? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It, it, it's, for whatever reason, it's taking me, this mm -hmm. section starting to yeah. cloud my mind. It'd have to be well above the market rate, I'd say, because a couple of standard deviations away. Because, you know, if you, because some people will still buy the product. Like, yeah, it has to, the farther away from the market price, the less it restricts it. Right. So what what do you think of the is the other exception to the rule? Quantity supplied. Well, how about that it's just it's absolutely necessary to produce this good for some reason. You know, no matter what the the selling rate is. Or maybe the existence of a black market. <laughs> I don't know what Yeah, I I don't know. What does the comment say? The marvelous civilization of antiquity perished because it did not adjust its moral code and its legal system to the requirements of the market economy. The Roman Empire crumbled to dust because it lacked the spirit of liberalism and free enterprise. Yep, I, I don't know. We'll have to just move on then. 
three minimum wage rates comment where there is neither government nor union interference with the labor market there is only voluntary or catalactic unemployment how can unemployment be voluntary I don't you, you don't want to work yeah I think it's pretty straightforward yeah There's there's no uh, interference in the market that's preventing you from working. You're just choosing not to work. Why does Misi say that Ricardo's proposition? Maybe it means something a little more le less or something a little less straightforward. Like unemployment seems to imply that you can't find the job that you want, and I can imagine that being happening in a situation of volunteerism by a, like a temporary misallocation of resources mm -hmm. you know like oh i wish i could work but it just they don't have enough machines at the factory yet right and uh i'm unemployed it's not through any interventionism or any interference it's just the market forces haven't adjusted yet mm -hmm. um why does Macy say that ricardo's proposition and the union doctrine derived from it turn things upside down. Why does he think Ricardo has misunderstood the direction of causality? I'm not sure on this one. Let's see if there's anything in the book about it. Minimum wage rates, part three. I don't know. <laughs> the union doctrine derived from it turned things upside down. What do you think Ricardo has misunderstood the direction of causality? Probably that, <clears throat> if I'm taking a guess here, it's that Ricardo maybe said something wrong about minimum wage rates, like, well, if you give the workers a living wage of $15 an hour at McDonald's, well, then they will spend more money and um, the business will make more money because they'll be paying a, a, a living wage and there will be more money in the economy. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that Mises would say Ricardo has misunderstood the direction of causality because it's only through um, the business making more money that they can pay higher wages, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why can real rage weights only rise to the extent that, other things being equal, capital becomes more plentiful? It's because of what I just said. I think that mm -hmm. a business only has what it has to pay people. Yeah. So real wage rates can only rise to the extent that capital is more plentiful. That's it. That's where the money comes from. So it's the only place. Does Mises believe workers have a right to bargain? Yes. Yeah. Does Mises approve of measures outlawing unions? I don't believe so. No. But uh, I, in this chapter, he makes a really interesting point about that, where unions use this term um, that I still hear today. It's uh, collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. And what collective bargaining typically means is the substitution of your own 
ability to negotiate your wages for some other person. Right. It's not like there's this mass of people. It's some other guy who's negotiating on your behalf. And, like, you can appoint someone to negotiate on your behalf, but it is not right to... It is not the correct... The term is misleading, collective bargaining. That is not what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you hear this term a lot in um, American sports. Um, There's... Every few years, there's usually a lockout in the NFL or NBA. because. Yeah, because the players have a union and they they come to a collective bargaining agreement with the league. Yeah. And I always find it it really funny because especially in a sport like basketball where players like LeBron James are like maybe a thousand times more valuable than the twelfth guy on the the Lakers bench. Mm-hmm. But the NBA always has a max contract and it says, you know, LeBron James can only make $40 million a year, even though like they're on TV because LeBron, they're on national TV because LeBron James is playing. Like they're selling out the Lakers, uh, the Staples Center every night because LeBron James is playing. And yeah, he's making like 30, 40 million a year. And then, but the twelfth guy on the bench is making like one million dollars a year, but LeBron's impact is like a thousand times more. Mm. So LeBron should be able to make yeah more the money. the star players in the NBA should be making like boatloads of money compared to the the guys all the way down on the bench. And it it and it's really interesting because the. the NBA players in the st- it's a very left leaning league, and it it's really surprises me that they haven't like especially the star players ha- who have this huge voice, huge presence on social media, that they they don't see that they are worth so much more than what they are actually getting, and I guess his income is some and I think it's part partly because th- his income is supplemented through endorsements. So he is still making like boatloads of money, and the probably a lot more than he ever expected to make in his life. So he's he's satisfied. Yeah, exactly. And but I agree. But if he's worth more and he could get paid more, and there's capital that could bear it, you know. Yeah, he should be getting it. Right. That would be great, because then there would be even more people trying to be LeBron. Yeah, I was just thinking maybe it's <clears throat> protecting you know, LeBron from being the greatest is because he, there's less of an incentive to, yeah, it's, yeah. it's interesting when you get to those dollar figures and that amount of wealth to see how much the marginal, like, like how much, you know, an extra 10 or 20 million is to you. Well, yeah. Or how much it signals to another athlete. For right. example, if I'm a young athlete who's equally good at baseball and basketball. But I see that basketball players are paid a hundred times more than professional baseball players. Yeah. I'm going to go to the place where the um, reward is the highest. Yeah. Well, that was chapter 30. I say we end it there because my brain is turning to mush. Yeah. So also that's like where I like I, I did a recap, and that's where I stopped. So Great. Well, let's pick it up at Chapter 31 sometime before Christmas break so that we can be done this hopefully by the end of the year. That would mm-hmm. be really, really great. But I only have like a week left. Yeah. So hopefully we can do it. Yeah, I think we can get close. If not, finish early. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, this was fun.